Hi, my name is Corey Hart. I'm an education specialist with Mott Fish and Wildlife. And today, this is part two of a four part series called Scadden Tracks. Scadden Tracks is designed for elementary age students, uh, grades K through six, and it consists of highlighting four different species. So this, this week, we're gonna be highlighting beaver. And then after we highlight beaver, you're gonna go outside uh, with either your parents or your school and look for a sign of the species that we discussed. You might not actually find beaver. You probably won't, but you might find signs of their habitat. So beaver are what is referred to as a keystone species, meaning they're a species that actually go out and create an entire habitat. So they're not creating just a habitat for themselves, so a place for them to, to live, uh, but they're also creating habitat for other species that are out there as well. So one beaver, beaver dam or beaver colony will create habitat for species such as moose, deer, a large range of other species such as fish, especially brook trout. Brook trout thrive in beaver ponds. So if you're a fisherman, that's a great spot to go out and get some brook trout. Uh, but also species like waterfowl, such as our ducks, geese, and other smaller critters that we don't necessarily think much about, like salamanders and frogs and stuff like that. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about identifying beaver. Beaver are extremely easy to identify. They're what are known as the largest rodent in North America. To ID it, we're gonna look at a couple key features. The first is gonna be its pelt. So I have a pelt right here of a beaver. You see it's usually well, br completely brown in coloration. Its rear feet are webbed. And hopefully you can see that on the screen. So this isn't an actual beaver foot, this is a cast of one. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes when we talk about tracking or looking for their tracks on the shoreline. So this would be the rear foot of a beaver. And the biggest characteristics of beaver that everyone knows them for is their large bear scaled tail. And that tail you might actually hear if you go out onto a beaver flowage and you might hear it slap the water really, really hard. And what that is, is it's actually warning the other beavers. So it's a defense mechanism that allows them to, to alert the rest of the members of the colony. So to reiterate, when we're looking for beaver or ID in them, they're the largest rodent in North America, and they're gonna have brown fur with a large bear scaled tail, and then webbed rear feet. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about habitat. So when you're out with your class looking for signs of beaver or looking for the habitat, the areas that you wanna focus on are gonna be wetland environments, meaning low flowing areas where I have a, a small flowing stream, and then usually it'll open up into a big wetland. Some of the key features that I'm looking for, if there's a beaver already there, is I'm gonna see signs of beaver activity, which would be things like a dam. So a dam would be placed on the stream itself, and it's gonna create a large backflow of water known as a beaver flowage. You also see some other signs of beaver activity, such as a lodge or an underground den, or an underbank den. And the lodge is actually where the beavers live. And you're not going to have just one beaver living in that lodge. There could be an entire colony of beavers that live in that lodge. So beavers are herbivores, meaning that they eat uh, bark and other plants. So as I'm looking for signs of beavers, one of the other types of sign that I might see is going to be areas where the beavers have actually chewed off trees. Uh, and we'll show you some of that in a minute. Hopefully, if we're lucky and can find some of that around us. If not, we'll throw a picture up there for you. Uh, what they actually do, though, is they might eat some of that bark there, but they also grab large quantities of brushy material and they create what's called a food cache. So in their beaver flowage, a little distance away from their beaver lodge, they're gonna store enough of the, the plant matter for them to last through a winter. So a, a family of eight beavers or a colony of eight beavers needs as much as 2,000 pounds of woody material to survive a winter. Because remember, Vermont's winter, winters are extremely cold. Uh, we get a lot of ice. These beaver flowages are gonna freeze right up. But the beavers actually survive the winter and they can get survive under the ice. So what they're doing is they're moving back and forth from the beaver lodge to their food cache under the ice. And they'll actually wear down a section of ice where it's gonna be uh, a lot less ice. So in one section of the ice, I might have a couple feet, but where they've been going back and forth, forth they're creating a current. So you always want to be careful when you're walking out on beaver flowages. Because just because there's a lot of ice in one area, if the beavers have been moving, there's going to be 
almost no ice in that, those type of spots where there's been a lot of activity because they're just going back and forth grabbing their food. Off to the left of us, we have a beaver lodge. And you might see a beaver lodge when you're out there in your travels looking for signs of beaver. So beaver lodges are extremely neat because they're the actual home of the beaver. So it's where they live. And there's not just one beaver living in there. There's going to be an entire colony of beavers uh, that live in that lodge. So just like we have a house that we live in, this is the beaver's house. While they can hold their breath for up to 15 minutes underwater, their lodge itself, on the inside, there's a cavern where it's actually open above water, meaning they swim through a tunnel underneath the water. And when they're inside their lodge, there's a section there where it gets them up above the water line. Also, during the winter months where it might be negative 20 outside, in their lodge, it's nice and cozy. It's certainly not 80 degrees like it might be in our house, but it's warm, it's plenty warm enough for the beaver. And it doesn't actually freeze up in there at all because it has their body heat is helping to keep it warm. So beaver colony consists of three generations of beavers. So in the colony, we're gonna have adult beavers, yearling beavers, which are beavers that are about one years old to two years, and what are referred to as kits, also known as the baby beavers. Each year, uh, when beavers breed, their mating season is in February, they typically mate for life, but that's not always the case. There are a few exceptions. Typically, there's one to nine kits in a litter, and at only about a few days old, they're going to be able to swim on their own. After about six weeks, they're going to be weaned off their parents. And so we mentioned before that in the beaver colony, it consists of the yearlings, the adults, and the kids. At about two years of age, the, the beavers that have, that have reached two years, they're going to actually be driven away by their parents as the next generation of kids come in, or they're going to leave on their own. Once they're driven away or they leave on their own, they're going to go off and start a new beaver colony. So they're going to look for the appropriate habitat. So they're going to look, find a, a stream that's free flowing in a low area, and they're going to dam it up and create an entire new habitat. So beavers have an interesting history in Vermont. In the early uh, 1700s, 1800s, uh, when settlers were first arriving in North America, beavers were highly sought after uh, for their pelt and their fur. Eventually, it got to the point where there, in the late 1800s, where there was almost no beavers left in Vermont. Uh, and that was due to a combination of things, both unregulated trapping, so we had no seasons on, on beaver at the time. Fish and Wildlife Department didn't even exist back then. Uh, but we also had a lot of Vermont's land being cleared for farming, and we were losing a lot of crucial habitat. By the late or early 1900s, uh, beaver were essentially completely removed uh, from Vermont. In the 1920s, uh, we reintroduced beaver to Vermont from populations in New York and Maine. By the 1940s, uh, beavers were doing extremely well in Vermont and were well established. So by the 1950s, the populations were actually doing so well in Vermont that we brought regulated trapping back. And that helps us to actually manage the population. Because with any population, when we get too much of a species, we'll start to have problems. So regulated trapping is an excellent management tool for us to this day that allows us to keep the populations under control. There's a couple other management tools that we actually use to help control the beaver population. Because as you might imagine, beavers don't always put their lodges and dams where we want them. Sometimes they build them in locations that flood out driveways or roads. And one of the management tools we use is something called a beaver baffle. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It quite literally baffles the beavers. Meaning, what it actually does is, and it only works in certain areas, particularly in areas where we have low amount of, amounts of water flowing. And what we do is we take a large culvert and we put it either over or through a beaver dam. And what that allows it to happen is the water is gonna keep flowing and there, the dam and the flowage can remain, but we're not going to have too much water backflowing. Uh, and that only works in certain situations. Another management tool that we use to help control the beavers, or uh, to control uh, beaver populations, is something called an exclusion fence. Because uh, occasionally, so beavers are known for they do not like flowing water. And culverts, or areas that 
where the road, roads cross are spots that beavers like to go up against. And what they'll do is they'll actually create a, a dam up against that, that culvert and a block it and put a lot of sticks and that in turn might wash out a road. So we create fences or what are known as exclusion fences, which is basically a barrier around the culvert that prevents the beavers from accessing that culvert and causing any damage. So those are two options we have. When either of those options don't work, sometimes we might call on trappers to help us uh, manage the population. And what they'll do is they'll go out and hope during uh, the, the regular beaver season that we have so that they can also use that beaver. So they can eat the beaver, uh, the beaver meat can be harvested as well as the pelt. Uh, so those are three ways that we manage the beaver population. And today in Vermont, our beaver population is thriving. You can find them across the entire state. So it's really interesting to think that at one point we went from having a ton of beavers in Vermont to the point that they were uh, just about everywhere and the fur trade was thriving. Then it crashed. And now we're at the point again where we brought them back and they're doing extremely well. And thanks to regulated trapping in Vermont, the population is staying steady. All right, so we're about at the point in the video where you're gonna go outside with your teacher or your parent and look for signs of, of beaver activity. Remember, when we're looking for signs of beaver, we wanna start in a wetland habitat. So in areas where beaver are gonna actually be. I wouldn't be looking for beaver in kind of an upland area. So where there's basically, or an area where there's a lot of oaks and stuff like that. I'm gonna look for it in an area where it's, there's a lot of water flowing and it's very wet. So some of the signs that we might find, beaver are very, very neat because there's a lot of signs of beaver activity that I can look for. But this episode is called Scat and Track. So the first sign we're gonna look for is beaver scat. And you'd find that usually along the water's edge. And you might also see, so typically beavers tend to use the same area. So you might see, and this isn't a good example right here, hopefully we can find one later. Uh, and you'll see it like almost like a path where the beaver have it going in and out of the water. And the water is gonna be usually really worn down and usually near there, you'll see a clump of scat. And it's typically all kind of clumped together. Remember, uh, beavers are her herbaceous, meaning they're eating a lot of bark, twigs, things like that. So it, it creates kind of a clumpy uh, looking scat. And before, before you start giggling on the video, don't worry, this is plastic. It's not real scat that I picked up. We weren't able to find any of that today. Some of the other signs that I'm gonna find as I go out and look for beaver, are gonna be a little bit more obvious. Finding beaver scats actually kind of hard. Uh, one of the more obvious signs will be something like a beaver dam, which you might be able to see behind me, or the beaver lodge that we showed you earlier. Those are usually really, really uh, obvious to find and once you get in those wetland habitats if beaver are around. Other uh, signs are gonna be where they've been chewing. So you'll find logs that have been chewed off by beavers where they've been gnawing at it. And it might be small little saplings on the shore. Sometimes it's even big trees that they've dropped. And you can usually find that along the wetland area. And a really good example is one right over there. So if you'll follow me, as I was saying, one sign of beavers that we often find is it logs that have been chewed. And this one we saw as we walked in, and it actually made me giggle because there's a sign that says beaver way. And on top of it, you can see the beaver actually chewed it. It looks like this was probably a log that would washed up and then somebody used it as a sign, but this is an excellent example of what beaver bite marks actually look like on a tree. So you see they'll actually gnaw all, all around it and they might drag, depending on the size of the tree, they might drag the limbs back uh, to a food cache, which is by their lodge. And you'll find these areas where there's been gnawed at. So you might find logs on the ground or, or stumps that have been gnawed at by beavers all along the wetland. So remember, when we're looking for signs of beaver, we are looking for scat, we're going to be looking for the tracks, which with beaver tracks are going to typically be found in the mud. And with their front paws are going to be really small. And their rear paws are going to have those big web feet that you can see on the screen right here. And those are typically going to be found that we weren't able to find any today, but you'll usually see them right along the water's edge where it's nice and muddy. So you see all my hand sinks right in? Those are the types of areas that I would be looking for for beaver tracks in. You might also find what's referred to as a beaver or a slide, where they've been sliding into the water. And that's just an area, like I was talking before, where they're, I refer to it as like a trail, where you might have a section where the beavers have been just going back and forth. 
and the water, the, uh, the ground will kind of be really worn down. Uh, so that's all the types of sign that I'm going to be looking for when you go out. Remember, when you go out with your teacher and you're out on your nature hike, to stay as a group and to stay on the path. If you go off the path, that's perfectly fine. But make sure that once we're off the path, we don't all walk single file. Because as we're walking, if a bunch of us walk single file through the woods and there's not already a path there, it's actually going to form a path. So when we walk out through the woods, it's important to actually spread out a little bit so that we don't leave sign of us actually being there. Well, go out and have some fun looking for beaver. <laughs>